Howdy folks, how we doing today? It's finally time I covered the knife that I promised you guys last week, the Rwanda Skinner, also known as the Pattern 20B knife from their website. I'm fairly certain that most of you out there watching this video probably haven't heard of this manufacturer, and I really wouldn't be surprised by that fact. The Rwanda Knife Company was founded in 1938 and is still family-owned and operated nearly 100 years after their original opening. Their knives are still hand-forged on an anvil and power hammer in their workshop in Bonner, Montana. While I won't go too far into detail in the company history, I will include a link in the description down below or, uh, to a video called The Bladesmith uh, featuring the company's current head. As to the subject of their knife, it is a 20B Skinner, as I said before, that is the pattern, and it is the logo of the company. If you look on their website, this is the knife they choose to use to represent their company. The most popular knife they currently sell, it is 9 and 3 quarter inches overall with a 5 inch blade. And Rwanda doesn't specify the com on their company website what steel they use for it. I've gone searching in forums around the internet and there seems to be consensus that it is 1095 steel, high carbon steel. Now for context, the 1095 is typically seen as a bit brittle and soft, but that's actually a pretty good thing for a hunting knife. In case you hit a bone, you can just take a file or take a uh, Smith diamond stone to it and you'll be able to get it back in shape. As for the rest of the knife, the handle is actually one solid piece of cast aluminum. It is cast onto the stick tang, and that makes it incredibly durable. It means it's not going to slip, it's not going to break if the rivet uh, strips. It's going to be solid as far as you can hold it, uh, as long as you want it. Uh, it does have two panels of Elkhorn insert uh, material, and that only thing these rivets hold in or onto the knife are these panels. So these are going to be extremely durable as well. They won't risk cracking, breaking, fracturing, any of that because there's not as much vibration transferred from the tang into these when you use it. The next thing we should discuss is the sheath. The sheath is actually fairly good quality. It's hand-stitched leather made in the actual factory and there's no heckle in Mexico on this sheath. There's no cutting corners made in China. This is actually made in America and it's high quality. It's actually fairly thick stock leather and it would be fairly durable but on the whole due to it being a fully encompassing knife sheath including that clasp it is impractical for use in the field. So what I recommend with this knife is that you go ahead and get a custom Kydex sheath. Either that or a nice belt sheath that only covers up the blade portion and leaves the handle free. That way when you're in the field you can just lock it in or throw it into the sheath instead of tossing it on the ground risking chipping or breaking the blade or losing it in grass. So before I bore you with any more talk, let's go ahead and get to the edge test. Now in the past you've seen me, I've tested cardboard, card stock, and th uh, my thumbnail. I went to the drawing board again and came up with something I think that's a bit more practical, a bit more common. I decided that I would cut a few different items that you would experience in your day-to-day -day lives. I decided to cut into blister plastic, blister pack plastic, tape, uh, tape covered cardboard, cardstock, and then paper. The reason for is these are some of the most common items you will use a knife on in your day-to-day -day life. A couple of things that are missing though that I wanted to include are both triple weaved 550 core to simulate a seat belt because seat belt material is actually quite durable which is why police and military have a separate tool on their kit used to cut seat belts pretty much exclusively. Uh, I also wanted to include a piece of leather here but it didn't get here in time so unfortunately that'll have to be the next time. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the cut test now, the edge test. I'll see you after. So let's go ahead and get started with this cut test. We'll start with the uh, blister pack plastic. Now this stuff is pretty frustrating to cut, but let's see if, oh yeah, you can see it's just gliding through that material. No problem whatsoever. And it's even doing slivers off of it, which for this material is pretty impressive. So we've got that one taken care of. Now, how will it handle tape covered cardboard? Whacked my cut clean through, hardly a burr on the actual cut. 
little bit of resistance, but you can see there. Yeah, this that should show you how tough this material is to cut on a day to day basis. Like it's causing me to whack the knife on my workbench here. And finally, we'll go through the cardboard test, which we've done before. We'll see. Oh, yeah. As you can see there, a nice little curly cue, as Chris would say, from that knife, uh, that company to be named later. And finally, some paper. Let's see how it does here. You can just hear how fine that edge is. Honestly, this knife came fantastically sharpened out of the box, and I wouldn't expect anything less than fine, uh, from fine craftsmanship. <sighs> so, what are my final thoughts on the Ruana Skinner? First, before we get into my final thoughts, I have to specify that this is the knife's original edge. This is a nice factory edge. I haven't touched it up, haven't done anything, change it up. This is how it came. So I also have to specify, my friend gave me this knife. I didn't buy this. I didn't find it in some pawn shop somewhere, so I don't have to justify the price I paid for it or defend it. I don't have a reason to break it down and say it sucks. This is just my honest thoughts on this knife. So to start with, I think it feels fantastic in the hand. I think that it is well formed and the weight to it is amazing for your skinning purposes. I feel like if you were to use this thing on an elk or a deer, it would just glide through and you wouldn't have to apply any pressure, which is great because if you have to force or you have to apply pressure when you're skinning, your wrist will get tired out fairly quickly. What I'll, I am worried a bit about the steel due to it being 1095, I can't really say I'm disappointed in its performance. That being said, I still worry about it because I don't want this thing chipping or breaking. And here's where I throw a little bit of a painful truth bomb at you. The price of this knife comes in at $490 on their website, and it isn't available anywhere else online. This is exclusively through their catalog and through their website. That being said, uh, like I said before, my friend gave me this knife. This is not something I purchased, and as such, I'm not defending it because I paid so-and-so, and I'm not tearing it down because of the flaws this knife has. My friend knows the owner of this company, knows I collect knives, talked to the owner, and managed to get me one. So, for $490, should you buy this knife? I think so. It's hand-forged. It's hand-fitted, and it's made by an American company that is still family-owned, has a history in the region they're in, and has a great reputation. And that's a true rarity in our modern times. Do I think you should make this an EDC or your standard hunting blade? God, no. The way I see this knife is how a grandmother might see her good jewelry. You break it out for special occasions, then put it away, and eventually it gets passed down to your grandchildren. The way I see this is a grandfather taking his grandson out for the first hunting trip. They're dressing the, uh, the first deer out the boy bags with this blade, cleaning it up, and then putting it in the closet or the safe until the next first hunting trip with the next grandchild. So on, so forth, until the grandfather dies, passes it down to the first grandchild, and the cycle starts over again, and it keeps going. And this knife will last generations in your family. The knife is comfortable, it's hefty like a good skinning blade should be, and has a great company behind it. While the price, the potentially weaker blade, and the oddly restrictive sheath keep this from being a perfect 10 out of 10 on my scale, like a company such as Rwanda deserves, I still think it's well worth the purchase if you are willing to scrimp and save to buy it. To sum up, don't be a fool, buy this tool. All right, so we've covered everything I think I need to for this blade. This is Iron Wings 3187 signing off saying God bless and tune in next week for the second episode of Storytime where I will cover yet another one of my untouchable knives. Thank you. God bless you.